The secret of the C-17 in the USS Henry M. Jackson. Operation 50 pounds that could rewrite the rules of the game. 9.40 a.m. Over the gray expanse of the Pacific Ocean, just 500 feet above the water, a massive C-17 Globemaster transport aircraft roars through the turbulence. Its 412,000-pound frame shudders in the unstable air currents, like a high-rise building during a magnitude 5 earthquake. Below, there's nothing but waves, and beneath them glides a shadow weighing nearly 19,000 tons, the equivalent of 100 C-17s the nuclear ballistic missile submarine USS Henry M. Jackson. The mission sounds absurdly simple. Drop a small package, only 50 pounds, next to the submarine. But behind that simplicity lies a puzzle that had defied solution for years. Drop it too far and three years of work by scientists, engineers, and the military will be wasted. Drop it too precisely and someone will have to explain to Congress how an experiment in aerial resupply turned into an American aircraft bombing an American nuclear deterrent. Inside the cockpit, the atmosphere is tense, like the moment before a leap into the unknown. The pilots have 30 seconds to prove to the Pentagon that supplying nuclear submarines does not have to depend solely on bases and ports. It can be done in the middle of the ocean, right under the enemy's nose. This is not a training exercise for the record books, it's an experiment that will either revolutionize submarine logistics or disappear forever as a failure. The story began long before the heavy transport hovered over the ocean, searching for a submarine in its depths. The question that troubled military strategists seems straightforward on the surface. How do you resupply nuclear submarines that remain at sea for months, hidden from the world? The usual methods are either a port call or rendezvous with a support ship. Both carry risks. The submarine becomes vulnerable. Its route can be tracked by enemy satellites, and any stop reduces its patrol time. So what if supplies could be delivered from the air, in the middle of the ocean, anywhere on the planet? It sounds simple, but history has shown that apparent simplicity is often deceptive. At one time, it seemed obvious that an aircraft designed for a carrier should be able to take off vertically like a helicopter and fly horizontally like a fighter. A simple idea. Yet it took nearly 30 years, from the first experiments in the 1940s to the British Harrier in the late 1960s, to make it a reality. If it were really that simple, why had no one tried to resupply a missile submarine by transport aircraft before? Because there were serious obstacles. First was accuracy. A massive transport plane would have to drop its payload into the ocean with near-surgical precision. A miss by even a couple hundred feet would doom the mission. No submarine's gonna linger in dangerous waters searching for a lost package. Second was the risk of damage. Precision could be a double-edged sword. Imagine hitting the submarine itself. What harm could 50 pounds of cargo really do? It's not explosives, but 50 pounds dropped from 500 feet at 60 to 90 miles per hour could smash antennas, sensors, hole plating, or the sail where the periscopes and masts are housed. If it struck a crew member, it could seriously injure or even kill. But if the concept worked, the U.S. submarine fleet would gain several strategic advantages. The most important is longer patrol endurance. Today, Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines can remain at sea for up to three months. Their limiting factor is not the nuclear reactor or onboard systems, but food and consumables. If part of those supplies could be delivered directly in the ocean, the boats could extend their patrols without returning to port, giving the United States longer continuous deterrence. It would also increase stealth and unpredictability. A port call or rendezvous with a support vessel is always noticeable to the enemy. Satellites, reconnaissance assets, and electronic surveillance systems pick up such operations without difficulty. Aerial resupply, on the other hand, can be conducted anywhere in the world's oceans, making the submarine's course far less predictable. Finally, there's operational flexibility. In times of crisis or war, submarines may be required to operate far from friendly bases. Air resupply makes it possible to sustain them even in regions where surface support is impossible. This turns the submarine into a more independent and mobile combat unit, and it must not be forgotten that the submarine force is the most powerful element of the United States nuclear triad. On October 22, 2020, the moment of truth arrived. At dawn, a C-17 Globemaster lifted off from Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii. Its four turbofan engines carried 412,000 pounds of metal, electronics, and human flesh into the sky, along with one experimental payload weighing just 50 pounds. 
a small box intended to solve a problem that had plagued admirals for decades. The flight plan looked straightforward. Fly 800 miles northwest, locate the USS Henry M. Jackson ballistic missile submarine, drop the cargo, and return home. In reality, it was no routine supply run, but a leap into the unknown. The submarine had been drifting underwater for six hours under strict radio silence. Ocean currents could have carried it anywhere. For the C-17 crew, the mission now resembled looking for a needle in a haystack, or more accurately, a single black dot somewhere in an oceanic expanse equal to four times the size of the United States. When the C-17 reached the halfway point from Hawaii, the hide-and-seek truly began. The USS Henry M. Jackson had been submerged for hours, drifting with the currents, maintaining absolute silence. The last confirmed coordinates had been logged deep in the night. By now, the submarine could be anywhere within a radius of dozens of miles. Searching under such conditions was like trying to find a speck in endless blue emptiness. The ocean offers no landmarks, no mountains, no shores, not even lighthouses. For a pilot, flying over the Pacific becomes a monotonous passage through an unbroken sea of blue. Yet that very emptiness is the enemy. Without reference points, even the best crew risks a fatal mistake. The crew activated the onboard AN-APS-133 maritime radar. Its beams swept across a radius of 250 nautical miles, transforming the invisible ocean into a field of green dots on the operator's screen. Any of those blips could be anything. A wave reflection, a school of fish, floating debris, or the strategic ballistic missile submarine itself. Sorting through this chaos was not the job of automation, but of human skill. An experienced radar operator learns to see faint patterns, a slightly straighter line among random splashes, a trace of stability in the digital storm. A mistake would cost too much, miss the target, and the plane would fly past. Overload the crew and the submarine would remain nothing more than a shadow beneath the water. It was not until 7.30 a.m. that the first awaited signal came. The submarine briefly broke radio silence, transmitting coordinates before falling quiet again. That short burst of communication lasted only 1.3 seconds, but proved invaluable. It revealed that the sub had drifted four miles northeast of the calculated position. The ocean seemed to mock them. Currents kept pushing the submarine off course, unraveling the search plan. The C-17 crew now had to adjust their heading, reframe the search, and widen the radar sweeps. Here lay the paradox of the operation. GPS accuracy for the aircraft was within 30 feet. But what use was that precision when the target itself drifted like a rubber toy on the waves? That's why military reporters later wrote, the crew was not searching for a submarine, they were searching for a ghost. At the heart of this experiment, there were no supercomputers and no complex guidance systems. Everything hinged on a small box weighing only 50 pounds, about 23 kilograms. From the outside, it looked unimpressive, a rectangular box wrapped in a waterproof shell with a Type 4 life preserver strapped to it. Minimum technology, maximum reliability. No GPS beacon, no electronics, no auto-tracking systems, just a float to keep the box above the surface and a bright color so the submarine crew could spot it. The logic was simple. Complicated systems fail. Simple ones float. And in the open ocean, where a single mistake could doom the entire experiment, the designers put their faith in primitive reliability. The irony was that this toy, weighing just over 50 pounds, was tasked with solving a problem of strategic magnitude. The way it landed in the water would answer a crucial question. Could the United States resupply its missile submarines directly in the ocean without compromising their greatest asset, stealth? If the experiment succeeded, this modest box would go down in history alongside the first vertical takeoffs or the launch of GPS. It would become a symbol of how a small detail can change the rules of the big game. By 9 a.m., the C-17 crew finally picked up what they'd been searching for on their radar, a faint flickering signal that appeared and disappeared again. It was the USS Henry M. Jackson. The submarine surfaced, exposing only part of its hull, and began preparations to receive the package. Now came the most dangerous stage. The operation plan was as follows. The submarine surfaces and deploys a small boat with sailors. At that moment, the aircraft drops the package nearby, the boat retrieves it, and delivers it back to the submarine. Once the transfer is complete, the submarine dives again. To launch the boat, however, the submarine had to hold position on the surface against heavy ocean swells and strong currents. Ballast tanks were continuously filled and emptied, while officers constantly adjusted the trim to keep the hull level 
preventing the submarine from rocking like a giant swing. From beneath the sail emerged the rigid hold inflatable boat, or rib, powered by an outboard motor. Four sailors found themselves cast into the open ocean to play their part in this dangerous choreography, to reach the drop zone at the right moment and recover the box before the waves carried it away. Above them, the heavy C-17 began its descent. At just 500 feet, the massive aircraft ceased to feel like a flying ship and turned into a sluggish colossus that barely responded to the controls. The crew could feel every pocket of turbulence heaving the plane upward or slamming it downward as if their flying house had suddenly been thrown onto a trampoline. Three very different forces had now converged in one point. The aircraft had to maintain its course and speed, the submarine had to remain stable on the surface, and the small boat had to enter the drop zone at precisely the right time. All of it unfolded in the open ocean, where even a single second could shatter the fragile synchronization. It all came down to whether these three platforms, the giant, the shadow, and the speck, could act in unison. At 9.40 a.m. came the climax. The C-17 rolled into its final turn, lining up directly over the submarine's course. In the cockpit, the pilots turned into surgeons, every fraction of a control input, every adjustment for wind and speed carrying decisive weight. The aircraft needed to fly exactly 120 knots, about 140 miles per hour or 220 kilometers per hour. The altitude had to be exactly 500 feet. Not higher, not lower. Beneath them lay the black silhouette of the USS Henry M. Jackson. Nearly 19,000 tons of steel moved through the waves at just six knots, enough to maintain steerage. Off the starboard side clung the small boat, a dot beside the giant, ready to dash for the package the moment it touched the water. In the cargo bay by the open door stood the loadmaster. In front of him was the very same 50-pound box, secured to the release mechanism. Running through his mind was a simple yet unforgiving calculation. In five and a half seconds of freefall, the package would drop 500 feet to the ocean. In that same time, the submarine would move ahead about 50 feet. The wind would push the container 20 meters east. The aircraft's forward momentum would carry the drop an additional 300 meters. All of that had to converge on a single point. A one-second error and the plane would release the package either 200 feet short of the target or 200 feet beyond. Three. Two, one. The countdown echoed in his head, and at that instant he pulled the lever. The package shot out into the open air. For a brief moment, it seemed suspended. Then it began tumbling downward, awkwardly spinning like a stone cast from height. Below, the submarine crew and the sailors in the boat watched, holding their breath. At last, a splash. The container hit the surface, plunged under, and immediately popped back up, lifted by its inflatable collar. The math had been right. The drop was not perfect, but it was close enough, only about 3,000 feet, roughly a kilometer from the submarine. For the small boat, that was nothing. Its engine roared and within minutes the sailors had the box on board. The experiment was over, over and successful. The cargo had not landed right next to the submarine's hull, but it had been delivered close enough for the mission to count as a success. To an outside observer, it might have looked like a trivial stunt. A transport plane dropped a box, a submarine picked it up. But in the scale of military strategy, it was a breakthrough on par with the invention of aerial refueling. From now on, ballistic missile submarines could receive vital supplies directly in the ocean without returning to port, without risky rendezvous with supply ships. They could remain on patrol longer. Their routes would become even less predictable for any adversary. To grasp just how significant this is, consider one fact. During the Cold War, a Soviet submarine commander who managed to pinpoint the location of an American ballistic missile submarine was awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union and the Order of Lenin, the nation's highest honors. That small 50-pound, 23-kilogram box became a symbol that even in the 21st century, the simplest ideas can change the course of the game. Since then, military analysts have noted that this experiment opened the door to an entirely new chapter in submarine logistics. From drones and unmanned aircraft to advanced drop systems, the fleet now has a precedent. And if someday a ballistic missile submarine stays on patrol for weeks longer, if it receives critical spare parts or life-saving medicine in the middle of the ocean, its crew will remember that it all began with one risky experiment. A C-17, a 50-pound box, and the sailors who tried for the first time to resupply a submarine from the sky. 
Thank you for watching. We'd be grateful for a like and a subscription to our channel. See you again very soon.